The autoencoder is a beautiful and precise piece of mathematics. If all you see is the intimidating looking formula and the arbitrary looking neural network setup, it just looks strange and impenetrable, as if it sprang up fully formed like the goddess Athena. What I want to do in this video is talk through the big three ideas behind the autoencoder and derive it from scratch. That way, you'll be able to derive your own autoencoder style setup when your goals are slightly different to those of the standard autoencoder. The starting point is generative modeling. Here's the generic setup for a latent variable generative model. Let Z, the latent variable, be drawn from some standard distribution, for example, uniform or normal with mean naught variance one. Let F be the neural network and let theta be the parameters of the network. And let X be a random variable, a parametric random variable whose parameters are computed by F of Z. And let's suppose we have a data set x1 up to xn, and we want to fit this model to the data set. In other words, we want to find the maximum likelihood estimator for theta. We just need to write out the log likelihood and maximize it. This is the derivation from the last video. It starts out like any other maximum likelihood estimation problem. The log likelihood for the data set is the sum of the log likelihoods of each individual data point because we're modeling them as independent. It's a latent variable model. In other words, X is generated randomly from Z. So to work out the likelihood of X, we can condition on Z using the law of total probability. The next step is just another way to write the integral. I find it much more intuitive to work with expectations rather than integrals. So that's what I've written here. It's an integral, i.e. an expectation over Z. And the thing we're integrating is the likelihood of Xi conditional on Z. The next step is the distinctive thing about autoencoders. We'd like to approximate this expectation using importance sampling. So let's do a change of variable and write it as an expectation over values little z drawn from a different distribution, the sampling distribution z tilde. Because we're changing the distribution over which we're doing the expectation, we have to put in the importance sampling correction factor, this likelihood ratio term. This is an equation, and the equation holds with equality for any sampling distribution z tilde. But what we want to do is choose a sampling distribution that leads to useful approximations, i.e. we want to be able to approximate the expectation with only a small number of Monte Carlo samples, and for that we need to pick a good z tilde. There's general theory, which we discussed in the important sampling video, that says that the perfect sampling distribution is this, the likelihood for Z tilde should be proportional to the numerator in pink here. Which, if you look at the likelihood function we just wrote down, turns out to be nothing other than Bayes rule. In other words, the perfect sampling distribution Z tilde turns out to be the posterior distribution of Z conditional on an observed value Xi. We probably won't be able to achieve this exact perfect sampling distribution, but that's okay because the important sampling method works for any Z tilde. But we do want to at least try to get close to it. At the very least, we'd absolutely like Z tilde to be chosen based on Xi. Okay, so this is what we want to optimize. We want to find theta to maximize this log likelihood. Note that I wrote here Z tilde superscript I, just to emphasize that the sampling distribution should be chosen depending on the data point Xi. Now, the first big idea of autoencoders. How do we figure out the sampling distribution? I don't know, so let's just hand the job over to a neural network. Let's imagine that there's a neural network G whose job it is to produce the sampling distribution Z tilde superscript I. We'll imagine that the network G takes Xi as its input and computes a deterministic function of its input. And then Z tilde I is a random variable whose parameters are chosen based on the output of the network. I've rewritten the sampling distribution here as Z tilde superscript I comma phi, since it depends not only on the Xi we feed into the network, but also on the parameters phi of this network. 
OK, so this is what our new goal is. We want to somehow learn a good phi and at the same time we want to find theta to maximize the log likelihood of the data set. To make progress here, we need to use one of the classic probability bounds, Jensen's inequality. This says that if h is a concave function and x is a random variable, then h of the expected value of x is above or equal to the expected value of h of x. I can never remember which way around this goes, so I always have to draw myself a picture. Concave means the function looks like a cave with a cave opening, and h of expected value of x is a point on the roof of the cave, so it's above or equal to the expected value of h of x. We'll apply Jensen's inequality here to log, which is indeed a concave function. And here's what we get. The log likelihood, L of theta, is above or equal to this expression here. Let's call it L sub LB of theta comma phi. It stands for log likelihood lower bound. And this inequality holds for any theta and any phi. The reason it's useful is that now we have a legitimate training task. The important sampling equation holds with equality for any sampling distribution. That's why there's an equality on the first line. That means that as a function of phi, the first expression is flat, so there's no incentive to push the neural network to learn a good phi. But the lower bound expression is a genuine function of both theta and phi. I won't go into exactly why that is here. I'll just say that it's simple to justify based on careful thinking about when Jensen's inequality is strict and when important sampling has zero variance. The notes spell that out. So this is our revised goal. We will seek parameters theta and phi to jointly maximize the log likelihood lower bound. Now, a simple theorem. This te theorem tells us about how good a theta hat we get from maximizing the log likelihood lower bound. Let's look at the two inequalities in turn. The first inequality is obvious. It just says that even though theta hat is optimal for the lower bound, it might not be the same as the theta that's optimal for the real log likelihood function. Well, yes, of course, this is just trivial. The next inequality says that the log likelihood lower bound is, well, a lower bound. That's just restating the result that we wrote down above from Jensen's inequality. OK, so these two inequalities together tell us that we get something useful from maximizing the lower bound. It pushes us towards a theta hat that, while it not, might not be optimal for the real maximum likelihood problem, still gives a data set log likelihood with a hard lower bound. And in fact, with a little bit more care about inequalities, it's easy to argue that if the encoder network G is perfectly expressive, in other words, if it's able to return the perfect sampling distribution by choosing an appropriate phi, then all the inequalities are equalities. In other words, we get exactly the maximum likelihood estimator. The full details behind this proof are a fairly standard style of mathematical wrangling with inequalities, and it's better to read them and work them out yourself with pen and paper rather than try to take them in from a video. But what really matters about all of this in the end is that we can define a useful objective function and seek to maximize it. And it's just a single function that we're trying to optimize in two parameters. We don't have this nasty situation of, well, a little bit of this optimization problem, a little bit of that one. There's just a single objective function for us to optimize in two parameters. OK, so this gives us the training goal for an autoencoder. The goal is to find theta and phi jointly to maximize this log likelihood lower bound. All that's left is to figure out how to actually do the maximization. And this is where the third trick comes in. Here's the obvious thing that we might try to do. We want to maximize the expectation of a certain function, so we approximate the expectation using Monte Carlo. I didn't fill in some of the details in this formula here. By this term in braces here, I just mean copy out the whole expression in braces above and replace little z by z subscript j. This is all perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with this. Monte Carlo is a perfectly good way to approximate an expectation. But it's not good for neural networks. We want to bang this into PyTorch 
and PyTorch solves maximization problems by using gradient descent. And to do gradient descent, it has to find a derivative. So let's think through finding the derivative. If we take this expression here, this sum, and try and differentiate with respect to theta, that all works fine. We just need to know the exact form of the likelihood function for x, and then we code it up, and then it can be differentiated. It's the other derivative, the derivative with respect to phi, that's a challenge. It's a challenge because to come up with this Monte Carlo estimate, we have to implement sample a random z from the distribution z tilde superscript i phi. And this sampling procedure is not a differentiable operation. PyTorch needs every line of our code to be differentiable with respect to phi. There's a very nifty workaround called the reparameterization trick. We just rewrite z tilde in terms of a standard random variable. Let's write z tilde as some function q applied to the parameters g sub phi of xi and f, where f is some standard random variable, for example, a normal. Then the expectation over z tilde can be written as an expectation over f, and then we Monte Carlo it. And what we end up with is differentiable with respect to theta and to phi. It works this time because our random sampling is sampling from f, not from z tilde, and the distribution of f is stable. It doesn't depend on phi. OK, so those are the three big ideas behind the autoencoder. Let's summarize where we got to. The goal is to train a generative model. Let's let L of theta be the log likelihood of the data set. But we don't have any way to calculate the likelihood function directly, so we need to try something else. And this is what we try. We train an autoencoder with an encoder network G and a decoder network F, and we try to maximize the log likelihood lower bound given by this formula here. It's an expectation over some exogenous random variable F, for example, a standard normal random variable, and so we can Monte Carlo it very easily and implement it in PyTorch and ask PyTorch to optimize it. And there's a theorem which tells us that what we find gives a lower bound on the log likelihood of the data set for the generative model with parameter theta hat. It may not be the absolute best theta we can find for the generator, but at least we can find it and it gives us a lower bound on L of theta hat. This is a good point to step back and look at what we've actually got here. There's something really interesting about the role of the encoder. Let me explain. Let's suppose you've trained a generative model. Maybe you didn't use this whole autoencoder setup at all. Maybe you had some other tools like a generative adversarial network, a GAN. You publish it and it looks like it generates good output. But how should it be evaluated? Without a proper standard evaluation metric, anyone can cherry pick pretty outputs and say, my generator is great. The natural way to evaluate any generative probabilistic model is by log likelihood. In other words, we should measure the log likelihood of the holdout data set that this generator gives it. But how do we compute the log likelihood? Well, you haven't given your audience any tools to formally evaluate your model, so they don't trust it. Let's try again. Let's say you train a generator and an encoder and you publish them. Now, people can just evaluate the log likelihood lower bound on the holdout data set. If the log likelihood lower bound is good, then the generator must be good. That's what the theorem tells us. If the log likelihood lower bound is bad, then perhaps your generator is bad or perhaps your encoder is bad, who knows? Your audience is likely to assume the worst and so they'll not trust your generator. The burden of proof is on you. If you really think your generator is great, then you should go away and work harder to find a good encoder for it. Once you do, it basically acts like a certificate that you can wave about and say, look, my generator is good, this encoder proves it. What I've described here, I think it's all logical and sensible, but it's certainly not current practice. I think that the ideas we've been discussing here, all the probability and lower bounds and so on, and even realizing that an autoencoder is really just a generative model with a certificate, 
All of this takes a lot of sophisticated mathematical thinking, and it's not widespread in machine learning practice, but it should be. This is the sort of deep theory that machine learning needs if it's to become a discipline rather than a craft.